Hey everyone, before we begin the show, I just need to give a little quick editing note here. Uh, as I was looking at the audio, it turns out that uh, somewhere towards the end, the audio cuts out for a moment because my recorder seemed to uh, pause and resume or something along those lines. Uh, I was basically in the middle of a sentence. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to get what, what I was trying to convey, but uh, there will be a brief pause um, as I'm going from track to track, I'm, I'm not sure how to fill it. Um, hopefully I'll be able to figure out whatever it was, uh, before the next episode. So anyway, enjoy the show. It's September 5th, 2014, and you're listening to episode two of the road to Japan. Welcome once again, everyone, to another episode of The Road to Japan. My name is Nigo. I'll be your host for this episode. Um, where do we want to begin? I guess I'll just tell you real quick that I am feeling pretty good. Uh, you did hear the date correctly. It is the 5th. Um, I realize that it's only been a few days since the, uh, the first episode. Um, but I wanted to get a quick episode. I mean, it's it's Friday, so I mean, it's not going to be relevant to anyone that's listening, you know, long you know, long time down the road if the if the show's still around. Um, but yeah, it's it's Friday. It's the weekend. Um, I'm planning on hitting a lot of the homework tomorrow. Um, you know, I just had a pretty rough day at work. I mean, everyone has those. Um, but I'm home. I. Got a nice shower, a shave. I'm feeling pretty good. I tried, I tried to pour myself a drink, um, but the problem was is that I forgot to pick up tonic water on my way home. Um, so I tried, you know, gave it a shot to just trying to sip on straight gin, and yeah, that's that's not going to go very well. Um, I I think just because I'm now in my 30s, my uh, definitely my party days are are behind me at this point or at least they are getting fewer and fewer as i'm getting older um so yeah sipping on sipping on gin is probably not going to be a good idea especially if i'm trying to do a show it, it could it could end up sounding pretty bad towards the end but uh anyway um i'm feeling pretty good because hopefully today was the last day of this uh, very sticky summer that we're having. Um, for those of you that don't know or don't remember, I live in Wisconsin now. Um, and because Wisconsin, or well, because Milwaukee, where, where I'm in, is uh, very close to Lake Michigan, uh, it's literally, I mean, I could drive here, or drive there, I should say, drive there from here uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, and because of that, uh, Milwaukee does tend to get pretty humid, uh, during the summer and it's, it's different from the summer in Portland because I'm used to, it's a bit more mild in Portland. Um, it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't, I don't want to say dry. It does get humid there as well, but it's, it's a different kind of humid in, in, uh, Wisconsin. It just, uh, it basically just makes everything sticky. Um, like you, you can sweat. I mean, obviously if you're doing like physical activity, like going out and running or, um, something strenuous outside, then you're, you're going to kind of get that slick sheen, uh, you know, that everyone's used to when they sweat. But, uh, just in general, just kind of doing normal, normal things or activities outside, uh, you just kind of get sticky. Uh, it, it's, Hard to explain, but I, I mean, basically your clothing, all of your clothing starts to stick to you. Um, and it's very annoying, especially given, you know, what I do for a living. And uh, it just kind of drives me crazy. So I've been kind of keeping an eye on the on the weather report. And I'm happy to see that uh, the uh, temperatures are going to go go down a little bit. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, something I'm definitely really looking forward to. Um, and hopefully that'll kind of keep my mood a little 
better at work. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned in the last episode, I'm not particularly fond of my job or the line of work that I do. Uh, I just try to kind of get by on the day to day activities. Um, but today was definitely, a uh, not stressful, but, uh, there were just things that irritated me that, that basically were reminding me of why I'm, why I'm doing this, but, uh, I'm actually going to use the next episode to, uh, discuss, discuss my jobs, um, and, and like my work history, I'm not going to give like my resume, but just basically like the, uh, the, the, the path that I've taken with my career thus far. And, you know, I feel that maybe explaining that will help, help you, the audience to better understand, uh, my motivations as far as what, what I'm looking to do. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, it's, it, it sounds probably more boring than hopefully it, it will actually end up being, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes on the next episode. Um, aside from that, there's, uh, you know, not a ton went on. I'm, I'm still, I haven't actually done a full week of classes yet. Um, because this week, um, actually the day that I recorded the first episode was Labor Day here. Um, which I think to anyone outside of the United States, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, but it is a nationally recognized holiday here. So, um, and it's definitely a federal holiday. So all the banks and institutions were closed. Um, and as well as, uh, my company, we had, we had the day off and it's a, it's a, it's considered a paid holiday. So it was very nice. Um, I spent the day making a podcast. So there you go. Um, but, uh, yeah, because of that, you know, one of my classes is on Mondays. Um, so actually next week, uh, I'll actually finally be in a first, you know, my first full week of, of classes, which only means that, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Thursdays, I'll be, I'll be busy, but, um, I'll talk, I'll actually be talking more about that a little, little later in the episode. Um, I did have a, a mishap with my printer, which is kind of a pain, but thankfully I got lucky in that. Um, my, my, uh, my printer stopped printing Well, it stopped printing black and white images, um, which is really annoying since I'm just now starting classes and I'm going to be writing essays and papers and stuff that I need to turn in. And of course the, the one ink color that I need the most is the one that's out of commission. Um, so it's really irritating. And because because I put a full ink cartridge in there, it, you know, the printer doesn't want to divert to using the, uh, the other colors to create the black, which is what it was doing while it was out of ink. Um, but thankfully I called the, uh, manufacturer and it turns out it's still under warranty. So they're going to send me a brand new unit, um, even with a full supply of ink. So that's pretty sweet. Not bad for a hundred dollar little printer. Um, and let's see. Okay. So I talked about all that, you know, stupid little nonsense, but I figure if I share these little nonsense stories, it'll kind of help, help you guys get, you know, like an idea of who I am and, uh, what goes on in day-to-day -day life for me. Cause I, I mean, I don't want to sound like this show is all about me because actually it's not, this is, this is a show that I want to, uh, get other people interested in. And I actually want other people to share their stories as well, which is actually leading into my next little subject here, which is, uh, the fact that I finally got the, uh, the proper email address set up for the website. So if you do want to, uh, drop me a line, uh, about pretty much anything, you know, was, uh, I mean, in relation to the show, I suppose. Um, but it's very simple. It's just email at the road to Japan.com. So, you know, it's like the URL, just put email at in front of it instead, and you're good to go. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, last time there there is a twitter account it's simply at the road to japan and uh, there is a facebook page if you just search for the road to japan you'll find it um and while this is probably not relevant to anyone listening to this particular episode right now the feed did get added to itunes so um i know a lot of people out there love their ios devices so you can uh, you can uh, go there and find it but chances are if you're Hearing this, you've already either found it through iTunes or you use the uh, manual RSS feed. So either way, welcome. Thank you for tuning in and listening to my rambling. Um, and speaking of rambling, I'm going to 
get right into it. I mean, I pretty much covered all the housekeeping I need to. So getting into the, uh, the meat of this episode is going to be talking about my uh, educational background. Um, I'm not going to start, you know, like from kindergarten or anything. Because honestly, I don't really remember a lot from from that, you know, my early childhood. But, um, you know, I I grew up pretty much like a like a good student. Um, I do recall elementary school being not easy, but it it didn't seem difficult to get uh, good grades. Um, and I I can't really say why that was. I don't know if it's just I was a good student or what, but um yeah, it wasn't, I didn't really struggle a lot as far as learning was concerned. Um, but the problem, the problem actually came when I got into high school, um, in which, or I'm sorry, no, that actually would be middle school where I started having troubles and the troubles was still wasn't anything learning wise. I was able to learn just fine. I just got really, really lazy and just stopped doing the work. And that ended up, it didn't make me like a failing student, but my grades did start to drop and um, that kind of followed me through high school. But I, I don't think I'm t saying anything new. I think this happens for a lot of people, you know, when they're when they're getting to that age, you know, other things start taking priority over um, over your over your schooling, whether whether it's right or not is, you know, it's up to the individual. But, um, you know, when I got into uh, high school it just friends and fun and things like that just became more important to me and my studies definitely uh felt the shock of that i, I even failed one of my classes in uh, my junior year and had to uh retake it my senior year and <laughs> i tell you when i failed that class that was sort of a wake-up call like oh crap yeah that that was not expected um I did for a long time blame the uh, student teacher that was in my junior uh, English class because I think it was English, um, but it had to do with like a research paper and it was like, it was a big paper too. It was like 11 or 12 pages. Um, it was huge. It was actually, it was a project that we had heard about as freshmen and was like the the thing that everyone dreaded. and. I definitely dreaded it myself and I knew it was coming. And then like just before we started, uh, started the, the research paper, my, my formal teacher switched over and allowed this student teacher that was, uh, working with her for half the semester, uh, take over for that amount of time. And then she ended up being the one grading the papers and gave me a bad grade and blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm, going to attribute it now to probably it was just a very half-assed paper. Um, I kind of wish I still had it because I'd like to look it over, you know, with my older eyes and see, you know, see if, you know, maybe she was on to something as far as, uh, as far as that paper kind of being a big pile of crap. But um, obviously I can't do that. So it's neither here nor there. But um, yeah, so I mean, when I, when I failed that class, that was definitely a wake up call and um, even still with that happening, I barely graduated high school. Um, like I graduated with a, uh, it was like a C plus average or something. It was a 2.6 GPA, I think, which I think is a C plus. I don't know my GPAs very well, but I know it's not, it wasn't a 3.0, which I know is a B. Um, so yeah, it was, <sighs> I don't, I don't know what, I mean, looking back, you know, I, I think everyone looks back on their high school years and their early twenties and they just kind of want to go, if they could get in a time machine and visit their former selves, they just probably slap them in the face and be like, what the hell, what the hell are you doing, man? Uh, or woman. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, that, that, uh, it, it actually ended up being a political science class that almost cost me my diploma and luckily i was able to make a deal with the teacher i think like the last week and she basically said she said if you do these three papers and you get passing grades on them i will pass you as far as the class is concerned um because i don't think i mean i think she was starting to feel bad um because she was 
likely aware that her class, you know, her the subject she was teaching is not really popular with a lot of the students. You know, mo most, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were some, some students in there that loved political science and they're, um, I guys, I kind of see them pop up every now and then in, in the social medias, like they're, 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 you know, they're not particularly friends with me, but they're like friends of a friend of a friend. Um, but they, yeah, they show up every now and then and they're, they're doing that kind of stuff, you know, political activism and crap like that. Basically stuff that we all predicted that they were going to be doing when we were still in high school. Um, so that wasn't really a shock there, but anyway, so I, I did those papers, um, probably half asked those as well, but I turned them in and like she literally gave me the passing grade. I think it, I th it must have, it was definitely the week of graduation. Like it, I remember it was right down to the wire. I think, I think I had to have that grade finalized by the next day or something in order to, um, receive the credit in time for them to literally print my name on the diploma and allow me to walk across the stage. Um, so I did that. Uh, but, uh, it didn't, I mean, <laughs> it was just, I bar like, I barely did it. And even after I was done, I didn't particularly care. And, um, that fall after, after I graduated, I joined the military, but that ended up not working for me as well, mostly because I like to make my own decisions and the military doesn't, isn't particularly fond of that. They like to make decisions for you. And well, beans as you sign a contract, you don't really have much say in it. Um, so I got out of that. That wasn't for me. Um, and, and then after that, I, that was, it was like around that time that I was starting to really get into, into Japanese and, uh, culture and movies and things like that. So, uh, and that's when I really started to take an interest in the language. That's actually what I, uh, originally in the, it, enlisted in the uh, Air Force for was to become a linguist, which is a fancy word for a translator. And uh, I originally was promised Japanese and that turned out not to be the case, but I didn't find that out until I was already in basic training and, you know, essentially signed six years of my life away, um, which is funny because then in basic, I was told I was going to learn Spanish, which, you know, to me was I was like, well, I mean, a lot of people speak Spanish here in this country, so I can make use of, of doing that. And, uh, just so you know that these language programs, you know, for the linguists, they're intended to make you fluent. Um, and not only fluent, but you're, I mean, you're knowledgeable in everything because when I was there, um, we were, we were in class eight hours a day and it was nothing but that subject. Like we didn't, have anything else it was there wasn't no um no political science no math no nothing it was just the language and then and then i think the second half of the day was uh uh like culture stuff you know learning we were learning like geography history um presidents or prime ministers where wherever it applies i ended up uh finally you know and it was literally the day that i was going to the classroom, they were telling me what building to go to and they didn't even, even then they changed it again. And I ended up learning or being, being placed in uh, Serbian Croatian, which is a Slavic dialect. It's, uh, it's, it's understood at least somewhat by, uh, Russians and vice versa. Um, so a lot of, apparently a lot of people around the, the, uh, D lab, which is where, uh, where these, uh, linguists go to, to do their studies. They called it ghetto Russian, which is probably not very polite or anything, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what they called it. And that's what I was learning, but I had no, I had zero desire to learn, you know, any kind of Slavic language, whether it would have been Russian or Serbian Croatian or anything. I want, I was only interested in learning Japanese, maybe Chinese. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just ended up not really working out for me. And then I, uh, I find, you know, I, I got out of it. Um, and then I, th that didn't stop my desire to learn. So, so then I, uh, in, enrolled in some classes, uh, at my local community college and that sort of got everything started. So, um, like I said, it was, uh, one class was like reading and writing and, the other class was like conversational speaking, um, 
learning how to uh, sound out the syllables, the vowels, you know, certain consonants, which actually one of which I will be discussing later as our little um, Japanese note. That's what I'm calling it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I I, uh, I, lear- I went through those classes, got A's in, in both of them, absolutely loved them. My teachers thought that I had a, a knack for learning it. And to this day, I believe that if you're learning something that you like, you're going to learn it a hell of a lot better and likely a hell of a lot faster. Now, I realize that there is some uh, some lack of truth to that being as I've been doing, you know, I've been learning Japanese for 10 years and I can still only, you know, barely hold a, a basic conversation. That is completely due to my laziness. If I really wanted to hit the books and learn it, I think I'd be a lot farther along, of course. Um, but I, I've, I mean, that's part of why I want to go to Japan is because you can't, you can't avoid learning it when you're completely immersed in it. And I, I've just learned over the years of just, you know, figuring out the type of person that I am is that sometimes I just got to force myself to do things. Um, and that, that probably is what led to me not going back to school for so long is because I just kept coming up with excuses. Um, I'm, you know, and I mean, part of it was lack of knowledge as well. You know, if I, if I knew what I know now, 10 years ago, I probably would have gone back to school or figured out a way to go back to school and would be done and maybe even be in Japan already. Um, but you know, of course I didn't, didn't do that. So, uh, here I am, but at, at least, you know, I, I'm also of the motto better late than never. So, um, you know, I, I think what, what sort of kickstarted a lot of this was when I turned 30, I know a lot of people have, uh, you know, midlife crises or, or whatever around, I supposed to be like their mid forties or something, or is it 50? I, I don't remember. Um, but that's, you know, when they typically start getting the sports car and, you know, dating younger women, blah, 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 or younger men, I guess, you know, it applies to women as well. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have a crisis of any sort but like when i turned 30 it just sort of hit me that i wasn't really doing anything um i was in you know i was working my job as a machinist and i didn't really like it and i was just kind of living day to day like it it just felt like my life wasn't really going anywhere um like i I, it wasn't like uh it, it felt stale it felt like my life if we were a piece of bread we're starting to get just hard and stale and that nothing was going to change that um so when i turned 30 i just got i don't know something something lit a fire under my butt and i just started started looking into things that i wanted to do and i started doing them um i remember one of the things that i did uh right away around that time was i always wanted to learn or at least i was curious I, I can't say I always wanted to learn because honestly, if I always wanted to learn, I probably would have done it a long time ago. Um, but I wanted to, or at least I, <laughs> around the time that I turned 30, I'll just put it that way. When I, around the time I turned 30, I got the sudden urge to uh, learn to ride a motorcycle. And, you know, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a lengthy and expensive process. And I mean, to a degree, I guess it is. Um, in both those terms, uh, because, well, I mean, the learning part is actually pretty easy. Uh, I just ended up signing up for a uh, course that's offered through the Oregon DMV, uh, or I'm sorry, not, it's not offered through the Oregon DMV, but it's like endorsed by it. Basically, if you finish this course, the DMV recognizes that and you can bypass all their tests and stuff. And you, you essentially automatically get your uh, motorcycle endorsement for your, for your driver's license. Um, and it was a, it was a three day course. I had, uh, two friends, uh, take the course with me, which was cool. And basically you, you start on a Friday night and you're done by the end of the day on a Sunday. You, you're literally, it just burns up one weekend and that's it. And it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like 16 hour days or anything. I think it's, I think it's only like seven or eight hours 
per day and each day is like a half and half so um one half you'll be in a classroom learning rules of the road and signals and what to wear what not to wear how to obey the law things like that and then the other half would be uh practical application so they literally put you on a bike and the really awesome thing about this particular program is that it didn't matter if you you didn't have to know how to ride a motorcycle ahead of time you could just um well you basically like like i was i had no experience i i think i rode on the back of a motorcycle a long time ago when i was a little kid but that was it i've never operated a motorcycle the closest i came is i operated an atv when i was in my younger younger teen years but uh I barely remember that, and I remember it was a disaster. Uh, and there, there was also an incident with a dirt bike, and I think I crashed that. So yeah, so far, you know, up to that point, my experience with things that had a throttle just didn't really work out so well. So I was slightly nervous about taking the class, but I mean, just the way that they do it was just awesome. It was great. It was it was seamless too. I mean, as long as you were paying attention and just following the instructions that were given to you. It, you know, riding a motorcycle became very easy. Now, don't get me wrong. There were a few people. Thankfully, I was not one of them, but there were a few people that ended, you know, got into my very minor accidents. I think, you know, nothing, nothing major because I don't think any of us got faster than maybe 10 miles an hour. I mean, literally, you're just doing all this in a parking lot and most of it's just riding back and forth uh, or riding in a circle. And usually you're following someone. So, I mean, they 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 had this course designed very very well um and actually at uh at the end of it what my instructor recommended that i um that i apply to become an instructor myself just because uh because i was i you know quizzed him on just a lot of a lot of other questions outside of the class you know when everyone else had gone home him and i were still out there for another half an hour 45 minutes just chatting more about the, the class and learning, you know, motorcycling. Um, so he thought I might have a knack for teaching it. And that probably was sort of what planted the seed of me thinking that maybe teaching would be an avenue to go. Cause I mean, um, as an instructor, it's, it's kind of more of a part-time gig. There's not many full-time instructors for that program, mostly because it does eat up a whole weekend of yours. So, most instructors don't want to work every single weekend um but it was something i had looked into uh never followed through with i think i got as far as writing a letter to someone and and they said yeah you should think about that but you have to take more uh advanced courses and you have to wait i think amount of time to gain at least some motorcycling experience i think it had to be like six months uh on a bike or at least after my course was done i think they expect you to be on a bike during that time which yeah f right after i got my actually before i even got my endorsement um i already had a a sale set up with a with a motorcycle i found on on craigslist and it was a great great bike it was awesome i missed that bike a lot um but unfortunately i had to sell it when i uh when i moved to wisconsin because that ended up just kind of being being one of the sacrifices i had to make because uh I I explored the idea of towing it or something, and you know it just ended up being too costly. Um, it was just easier to to sell it off, and you know remember remember the times with it fondly. And I, you know, I mean, maybe someday I'll I'll get another motorcycle. I do I do enjoy riding. It's it is a lot of fun. And there's nothing to say that you know if the day ever comes that I'm in Japan that I can. Uh, get you know get something on two wheels over there as well because i do understand that that can be a very easy and popular way to commute as well and i'd much rather do something like that over a car like if you don't know motorcycles usually get pretty awesome gas mileage if they're low enough in the cc's um i had a 200 cc bike which doesn't go very fast uh it usually topped out under 60 miles an hour which I mean, you can maybe get away with that on a highway, but you'd have to be in the slow lane pretty much the whole time. Um, and I mean, it, it would just wasn't a bike design to really do that kind of traveling. It was it was definitely a road bike. Um, so I I used it as a commuter, and it was great. I mean, my my fuel bill for the months I was riding my motorcycle was extremely low. It was awesome. I loved it. Um, 
But anyway, I've I have really trailed off here. Um, so uh, with that, you know, I I uh, I finished the Japanese courses and then I just kind of stopped going. You know, I just stopped the whole school thing. Um, I was actually looking at brochures for other colleges, trying to figure out um, like a an actual program that I wanted to go into. Um, and at the time I was leaning somewhat on art Institute doing uh, video game design. Uh, thankfully, I mean, looking back on that, I think that would have been a bad idea to actually follow through with it. Cause I think, I think art Institute doesn't have that good of a reputation anymore. Uh, I mean, granted this was years ago. This was like at least 10 years ago, um, that I was looking into it. And I think since then it's sort of gotten a bad rap for just being a overpriced, uh, art school that doesn't necessarily guarantee you a spot in whatever field you're doing. Um, so yeah, thankfully I didn't go through with that, but the reason I did is because, or the reason I didn't, I should say, uh, is because as like, literally I was looking at brochures and my father walked through the door of my bedroom and told me I had a month to get out to leave. Um, so yeah, I pretty much had to, you know, toss those brochures away because there was, I mean, now I had something completely different that I had to focus on, um, which was, you know, taking care of myself, uh, which was pretty rough because, I mean, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a car. I was pretty much your typical 20 something lazy ass. Um, so after, after he threw me out, because I follow, I followed that calendar, you know, he wanted me out a month. I was gone in a month. Um, Thankfully, I had a, a girlfriend at the time that was kind of living on her own, sort of. It's hard. It was a difficult situation to explain, but she was on her own, sort of. Um, so I stayed with her while um, while I was saving up money because I, I found a job within that month. Um, and then I saved up money to buy my first car and uh, went through went through with that. And then eventually after that, saved up money to get my own apartment. Um, which I got my first place and you know, things, things happen. I mean, I don't bore you with the, with the crap in between, but, um, a few years later then I started getting in, you know, I, um, I got into my machining career, which I'll, I'll talk about that more in detail next time. Um, but, uh, yeah, then it, you know, you basically just kind of fast forward and, and last year, cause you know, now it's 2014, uh, years, three quarters of the way over already. Um, but years, uh, last, last summer, uh, is when I moved to Wisconsin and that was the real driving force behind me realizing that I could, that I could, you know, actually do stuff. I mean, when, when I took that motorcycle course, that was just the beginning like that. That was, I was rather pleased with myself because of the fact that within a short amount of time, I said, I want to learn how to ro ride a motorcycle. And so like within a couple of weeks, I started researching it, figuring out how I could go about this, found something that worked for me financially and with my schedule. And then I just did it. You know, I mean, yes, I had, uh, friends do it with me, but that was just, that was like icing on the cake. It doesn't, it didn't matter whether they were with me or not. Um, I mean, obviously I enjoyed going through it with people I knew, but I was going to do it no matter what, you know, even if they, even if they weren't able to join me, which I mean, was a possibility. They said at one point it might not fit with their schedule, but, um, you know, I, that was, that was just evidence of my determination that I could, that if I was determined enough to, to do something that I was going to do it and I was going to figure out a way how to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I, when I sort of forced myself into that situation of moving, um, cause literally when I, when I said the words, I'll be there in a month, I knew I was going to hold myself accountable for that. Um, so, you know, once, once I did that, I mean, I mean, I remember spending my first night here in my new apartment in in, uh, in Greendale where I moved to and just kind of being surprised with what I just did. I mean, three days traveling 2000 miles in, in the car with, you know, my cat as my co-pilot. Um, for those you don't know, I have a cat. Her name is Motoko. She's a black cat and she's 
annoying sometimes, but but I love her. She's been with me through you know this whole ride since uh, 2007. So yeah, she's a good cat. Um, but uh, yeah, you know when I uh, when I got here, it was it just uh, kind of blew my mind a little bit. And I mean, I understand that probably this is nothing to a lot of people um, because I'm sure a lot of a lot of people do this no problem. I mean, they do it normally. Sometimes, sometimes they're doing like I was amazed that I was able to do it. I couldn't even imagine if I had like a wife and kids and things like that that had to come with me. I mean, I I made the executive decision for me by me to do what I did, which was like you know sell most sell or get rid of most of my things, pack it all into a car or pack what I had into a car and then just go. Whereas if I had, uh, you know, if I had a family or even, or even just a wife or even a girlfriend at that time, um, like kind of not, I don't want to say holding me back, but, um, you know, just having that extra hurdle to deal with, um, which actually was part of the reason why I decided to do it when I did was because of the fact that I didn't have anything like that tying me down. You know, I didn't have many, didn't really have any friends. Um, at least not any that I saw on a regular basis. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have a girlfriend. I was single at the time. Um, and yeah, and, and I don't, I don't have any children, at least to my knowledge. Um, so I figured that was as good a time as any to finally do this stuff. And I figure I need to start like, that was part of when I turned 30 was the fact that I hadn't done anything. And if I was going to do some of the things that I wanted to do, I needed to do it before I got all old and gray and shriveled up and, you know, kind of gave up on doing those things. Um, so that's like my driving force to doing what I'm doing now. Um, so kind of getting back to the whole education part of it, um, cause I know I really trailed off there, uh, going more into more into my background. I wasn't expecting to do that. So I apologize. But, um, when I, when I started this curriculum, well, I started the IT program just because it sounded like something I would be willing to do. Um, and so last semester, I just took two courses that were required in that program. And I literally looked through the list of uh, requirements for, um, for this degree and decided that economics and sociology were going to be the two least favorite that I was, that I was going to, dislike those the most. So I decided to do those first because I, especially at that time, I was all excited and rearing to go. I was, cause I mean, I've been wanting to go back to school for a long time, um, for a variety of reasons. And I'm sure those reasons will come out, you know, as, as these shows go on, um, as I just have, you know, had to have the opportunities to, to explain that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was really excited. And so I figured I should take care of the classes I liked the least, or at least the subjects I assumed I was going to like the least, uh, first right away, because I know I hear, I've heard stories of, of people, um, uh, putting those off till the very end. And then you're going through two, three, four, maybe even more years of, of college. And then you're leaving all the worst crap for the very end. Like, that's not how I want to really approach the finish line. I want to hit it, you know, strong and fast and hard and still do it with a smile on my face. So I'm trying to strategically, at least as best I can, knock out subjects that I'm not particularly as interested in early on. But the funny thing was, is that I turned out to really enjoy my economics and sociology classes. I think part of that's credited to the instructors that I had. They were very, they're both uh, very charming and wonderful women. Um, one of which actually is a, f a friend of mine on Facebook. Um, and I mean, they, they're, it was just the way that they taught the classes that got me engaged and like happy to be a student. Um, which I mean, I think, I think it's just the case overall. Cause I mean, I'm enjoying being a student even now, you know, not being in those classes anymore. Um, but I, I definitely am feeling differently with this semester. At least I, I can't, it's hard to say after only, you know, a handful of, uh, 
classes have been done, but uh, like I'm I'm pretty sure because I'm this semester I'm taking uh, math, which is like a I think it's a pre pre algebra course or something like that. Because there's a placement test that obviously you take when you enroll into the college. Um, here at at my my school they call it the Accuplacer. I think it goes by different names. It, like some gimmicky name for each each school but uh here it's called the accuplacer um and i'm i believe i scored in my math just below the uh required score for taking the algebra course in the accelerator program that i am applying towards um so the uh the woman the nice woman that helped me kind of transfer my program suggested that because because I can't enroll in it until next semester anyway, my um, probability of being accepted in the program will be heightened if they see that I'm taking the prerequisite for that algebra course that's part of the program. So I, you know, of course I agreed to that. I'm like, well, it's fine. Chances are, I mean, even if I don't get accepted in the program, I can still pursue a liberal arts degree. So I would need to be taking these classes anyway. Um, I just hope that I can get accepted in the accelerate program because then I'll speed things along. Um, but uh, I remember why I didn't like taking math in high school and why I eventually stopped taking math in high school. I took I took just what was required and then I dropped it. I dropped math. Like my math teachers were like, "Well, you're you're good, you know, at math, so you could stay and continue on." I'm like, "I don't I don't like doing it anymore." And the main reason is because I'm able to do not all of it, but I can do some of the math in my head. And what pisses me off about math courses and, you know, the math teachers is that they want you to show your work. And it frustrates me to no end to be like, I'm doing this in my head. I don't have a calculator. What, what do you want? I mean, what do I have to do to prove that I'm doing this in my head? And I guess now there's like some, like I was talking with a, a friend of mine that I work with um, and he's 10 years younger than me. So he's telling me about stuff that um, he was experiencing in, in high school, which was just a few years ago for him. And I guess there's there's like uh, a thing where students will will like take pictures of their uh, assignments or tests or whatever with their phones, and then they'll send them off to a friend or something. And that friend will either text them back answers or write them down. I'm not even sure how it works. It sounds really, really way too complicated for uh, definitely for someone like me. Um, I literally am kind of feeling get off my lawn, you know, when I am hearing stuff like that, I'm like, really people waste their time doing that. Where, why, why would you do that? Um, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I know, I know that there are people that do it even, you know, it, at the college level, um, some people breeze all the way through it. Like, uh, I know some people make money, uh, offering to do your homework for you. That's like how they make a living. Cause they're, you know, either really intelligent or have a bunch of notes from their classes or something, or I, I, I don't, I don't know how it works and I'm not particularly sure I want to know. Um, just cause while I believe I am noble enough not to ever pursue that, I don't even want the, um, I don't even want the remote enticement of of that being available. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, so anyway, I'm in, I'm in this math class, and of course, you know, my teacher is wanting me to show work and stuff. And I don't know what the extent of this will be until next week because we have um, we have our first test coming up, and. Uh, you know, I do the homework assignments. They're all, they're all done through a website online, which is obviously very different than the homework I used to have in high school. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm literally just sitting here at my computer with my calculator in my hand doing all these, this homework, but I'm also figuring out, making sure that I know how I'm solving the problems along the way. I just don't want to waste all that time with scratch paper and all this crap. So it's like, I understand how to do it. And, you know, like I said, a lot of it I can do in my head, but I just feel I'm going to have to waste a lot of time writing all this extra crap down so I can get proper credit on a, on a test. Um, so that's going to be probably my more frustrating class. Um, 
and then I and then I have uh, my English class. So math and English are the two classes that I actually go to a campus for. Um, I also have psychology and history, but those are being done online, um, which I'm doing those to get a taste of what the online aspect of uh, of you know college is going to be. Because obviously, if I get accepted in the into the accelerated program, it's all going to be done online. So um, there's there's like I'm seeing I'm already detecting like pros and cons with going that route um, because I actually do like uh, being in a classroom. I do enjoy that. Uh, I like the interaction. I like meeting, you know, your fellow students. Um, I especially like when you're when you're able to get your ideas on the same level. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's like, you know, when you're doing when you start doing a group discussion, at least for these classes I've taken so far, the teacher will l usually leave open-ended questions so that someone can raise their hand. And, and sometimes it will start an actual discussion within the classroom, which is great. It's awesome. Um, and that's definitely going to be lost with taking these classes online. Like I, I think, I don't even think psychology has any kind of interaction between the other students. Um, I don't know that for sure. Uh, I'm going to obviously be doing uh, and catching up on any any of the work in those in all my classes uh, tomorrow um, and Sunday because that's pretty much what I do. I'm dedicating my weekends to doing homework. Hooray! Um, <laughs> but uh, I know I know history has they have like a discussion board, which pretty much if you've ever been on a forum, you know how that works. Uh, it's that's the original poster, which is the teacher will. Um, throw up a question and then we the students will respond to it and we have to follow certain rules to show that we were we were paying attention to like the readings that were assigned and things of that nature um, so I mean at least there there is some interaction I was afraid that uh, thankfully at least this week that that has not been the case but I was afraid that uh, all the students were going to wait until Saturday because these assignments are due on Sunday, I think at midnight or some some crap like that. Um, but they're due at the end of the week. And I was afraid I was going to have to spend my Saturdays trolling these uh, these forums looking for waiting for all these slackers to, to post because I started work on this last week before the assignment even began because that's just the way I feel I'm going to be able to stay ahead is if I get ahead. Um, which is why I'm looking f that's see, that's a pro that I'm seeing with the accelerated course, because chances are, I mean, if there is, if there is student interaction in any of those classes, likely they're going to be students like me that want to get ahead and get this stuff done as quickly as possible. So, you know, there may be even more motivated students than I am. I mean, I, I would like to think that I'm not at the top. I mean, that's, that sounds egotistical to say, but, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the, the one that always starts the conversation that usually annoys me. Um, and when it comes to discussion, like I posted the, the reply in the discussion and, um, thankfully yesterday, yesterday or the day before, finally, some people started, some other students started responding. So, um, I'm going to look that over and, uh, join in that conversation. Um, but I don't know. It's uh, it's hard to say, like how I feel at this point. You know, with this semester, I loved last semester, probably because partly I only had two classes to worry about, and they were uh, 100 levels, so they were slightly easier. At least I'm well. I'm again. I don't know um, just yet because it's still very early in this in this semester. So we shall see. But uh, you know, you'll be getting updates from from me as far as like what's going on with classes because i'm sure the next episode i'll mention that uh that math test and i think i have a psychology test as well like on the history of psychology or whatever um the psychology one should be really interesting because that was the subject i was thinking about doing um in regards to uh actually pursuing my my major in in my bachelor's degree um i don't know if that's going to be the case who knows well, this is this is all part of the journey that you are coming along for is that, you know, uh, you're you're literally hearing me figure this stuff out. Um, 
And I mean, hell, if you if you so desire, you can email and tweet or do the Facebook or whatever, and you can join in the conversation. It doesn't have to be just my end. You can totally jump in. Maybe you have some recommendations. Maybe there's something I haven't looked at yet that might be just freaking mind blowing to me. Um, I I definitely was thinking of wanting to obviously make Japanese a part of my bachelor's degree, just because I do want to. I do want to get back to learning Japanese in a classroom setting um, because I think that's at least thus far been the way I've learned the most in the shortest amount of time, probably because I am being forced to go to a classroom and sit in front of a teacher and, you know, providing I'm being a good student and just listening to everything that he or she is saying and following their instructions and so on and so forth. so I'd like to do that to some, at some level. I, I don't know if I can make it a minor. Like this is stuff I haven't looked into just yet because it's not anything I can apply towards the degree I'm working on right now. And the, you know, even if I'm able to follow this accelerated program, I don't think I'd be able to graduate till next winter anyway, or it definitely wouldn't be any later than the, than spring of 2016 if I get accepted and I follow, you know, do all the work and, and everything, which honestly, I think that's all I got to worry about at this point is just doing the work. Don't turn into the to the slacker I was in, in high school where I would get a homework assignment and I could do it. I just didn't want to bother taking the time to do it. That's all I got to do. You know, I just need to read what I need to read and write what I need to write. I have a three page essay I need to write for English uh, next week. And it's just it's just a descriptive essay. And I'm going to write about the town I grew up in because I figured that'd be really easy. Um, but I, I'm not dreading it because, because I've discovered that with my writing, I just write until I'm done. Um, which thankfully, you know, if you've probably gotten a taste of it, listening to these two podcasts so far is that I can kind of trail off. So it's not hard for me to find words to put on paper. I'm sure filling up three pages, especially double space. I mean, come on, that's, that's easy. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not really worried about that. I'm not worried about any of the papers I got to write. I do have to write a research paper, I think for psychology. Um, and I think they want me to get started on that pretty soon, probably within the next week or two, I have to at least come up with a topic or something. So yeah, if you know of a good research topic for psychology, feel free to drop me a line, uh, email at the road to Japan.com, or you can tweet me at the road to Japan. Um, so, okay. So we'll, we'll cut it. We'll call it good for the, uh, for the education. I'm sure you'll hear more about my classes as, as the, as the show goes on and things like that. Um, so let's move on after a freaking hours passed, at least according to my clock here, hours passed. So let's, let's jump into, uh, our little Japanese segment. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to bother with a name for it. I'm just calling it Japan note for now. Um, but uh, what I wanted to talk about, because I, I mentioned uh, last episode about the uh, the vowels and how to pronounce them and how simple it is, is a i u a o. That's it. As long as you know that, you don't even necessarily need to know the order, but knowing the order will make it easier to uh, get all the other sounds as you learn those as well when you start putting in the consonants and whatnot. So um, what I'm going to talk about here is another another pronunciation and this is usually one that i think definitely a lot of us americans or native english speakers have trouble with it i don't think it's a much as much of a problem for other other language speakers um like non-native english speakers uh or wait did i say that right non non-english speaking people well you know what i mean Basically, some anyone that speaks a foreign language may not have as much trouble with what I'm going to be talking about here. And again, do not do not determine, do not think of me as like some kind of expert. I am not an expert, but um, this is based on when I was taking that conversation class years ago, and when I do from time to time speak with uh, native Japanese speakers, uh, typically through. You know, there have been times I've spoken with them over the phone or more, more commonly through uh, Skype 
or some sort of internet service. Um, but uh, what I'm going to talk about is the sounds that uh, are associated with the letter R. Um, basically, how to pronounce your R's in Japanese. Um, it's kind of tricky, and I'm trying my best to remember how I was taught how to do it because it's one when it was taught to me, it seemed to be really easy to pick up. Um, and I mean, you obviously notice that um, like Japanese when they're learning English have trouble uh, saying ours the way that we say ours. Um, like they have trouble with the ru. They, they don't, um, that is, it's mainly because that's not, that is not a common, that's not a normal sound in Japanese. You know, you, you don't hear ru. If you're hearing ru, it's because they're mimic, um, it's basically like a katakana word. So, um, you know, maybe they might try to say, uh, like, I, I don't, I can't think of an example right now. I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but I think you get what I'm saying is that usually when you're hearing, uh, a Japanese native try to say ours the way we say it in English, they sometimes have trouble. And I think English speakers have similar trouble when they try to pronounce ours the way they're supposed to be said in, in Japanese. So the way the, the easiest way I was taught is that it's a mixture. Like when you say your ours, um, and, and I mean, it's always, it's always the, the sound followed by one of the vowels. So you got dot de do de do. Um, and, and so the way that you, the best way that I was taught to pronounce my R's was to mix the sound of our R in English and our L sound. So you got la and you got raw. So you're kind of combining the two and that's how you get your da and uh like they actually my teacher actually taught me to you place like the tip of your tongue right behind your front teeth your top front teeth um right where the tooth meets meets your gum line kind of place the tip of your tongue there and that's where you will get your sound from so you go da and then you just kind of it's hard it's, it is kind of hard to explain in audio form um but uh you know with a little practice you can you can definitely uh get it down but the, like i said the easiest way that i learned to do it was mixing l and r um like if you listen closely when when you're listening to natives speak i don't i don't want to make myself the example because i don't i don't think mine's still very very good it's maybe acceptable but still not very good um but uh you know, listen when you're hearing the the words in Japanese done with an R sound. You can actually, um, you can even use Google Translate um, because they have a feature on there, on their website or their app um, that has a little speaker icon. When you translate a word and it will, uh, it will actually have the word spoken for you. Um, and it's, I assume it's done with a native speaker, um, at least pronouncing syllables. Um, but I mean, I've list, I've definitely listened to a number of words spoken through the translate, and it sounds to me, at least, like a like it's a native speaker. So that might be a good good route to go. Um, obviously, you can you know we have YouTube, so there's not it's not like there's not a plethora of um, ways that you can uh, find someone natively speaking Japanese, and then it's just a matter of picking out the you know, words that they say, um, there's a, there's a common word used in, um, in greetings in Japanese, which is, uh, Yoroshiku. Um, and that, that second syllable is ro. So that's one place where you can listen. Insert filler audio here. I know it too much into culture. Cause I don't really think I know that much about Japanese culture yet. Um, but my understanding is that you know, when you're, you're using less formal with people that are maybe like your own age or younger than you. Um, and you typically tend to use the more polite, uh, Japanese, uh, with, with people, people older than you or of higher status. Um, I know status is definitely a big thing over there. Um, and they, they value respect, um, which 
I can definitely appreciate because you don't you don't see a ton of people having respect for others over here in America. I'm not saying it happens with everyone, but uh, it definitely happens a lot. That's for sure. Um, so you know, there you go. There, there's your R sounds. I'm I'm sure I probably didn't really do that less than justice. Um, but I'm just trying to throw tips out here I, and I'm kind of pulling these out of my butt for, for now. Um, if there's something that maybe you'd rather I discuss or something that maybe I could research or something that you yourself want to share, you are more than welcome to, you know, I, I've given the email address already and, and the, the Twitter account and the Facebook. Um, I don't have comments enabled on the website just cause I primarily use the website just for posting the show and, and, you know, just having a home for, for all the podcasts. I don't really want to necessarily go there, at least not for now. I don't want to really go there and, uh, have to have to deal with reading user comments or anything like that. Uh, cause then I got to figure out, you know, getting people registered and all this other stuff. And I just really don't want to do that right now. Um, so I do have the, the Facebook page, so we can definitely have like a, kind of a community thing going there. Or like I said, you can follow the account on Twitter. Um, I do, you know, have that set up through my mobile devices as well. So I'll see tweets coming through and things like that. Um, I do have my personal account as well on Twitter. I don't really use it that much. Um, but if you're really inclined, you can, you can follow that as well. But honestly, if you, if you just want to stick with show stuff, just follow the, the account for the show and you'll get your updates there. But, you know, upon request, I'll give out my personal Twitter handle as well. Um, I did also want to mention real quick, I should have said this at the beginning of the show, but, um, I wanted to, uh, add that, um, that I was going to do, if I had enough requests, do a, uh, phone topic or not, a, not a phone topic. I'm sorry. Add a, a phone number for people to call. And, um, if you so desired with that, you could do that as well. But, um, that's not anything I'm going to worry about right now, unless people start asking for it. So if you were wanting to leave a voicemail or something, then, you know, after enough requests, I'll, I'll start looking into that. But, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's all that. So I don't know, I guess I'll probably end the show at this point. I'm just looking at my clock and it looks weird. It's saying that I've only been recording for three minutes. So I'm hoping I didn't just screw something up, but, uh, well, I'll have to figure that out. Uh, hopefully this, this ended up being a, an entire show. Um, if not, I guess I'll have to figure something else out. But uh, once again, thank you for listening. Uh, next week, I'm going to probably talk more about the uh, the job history. And then I'm going to lead. That's going to lead into a lot of the motivating factors um, for doing what I'm doing right now with the, with the school and the, and the podcast and, and all that. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are as well. Um, but for now, this has been episode two of the road to Japan. My name is Nico and I'll talk to you next time.